Welcome to Reliability Matters, a podcast for the electronic assembly industry. Each episode covers topics related to reliability, best practices, and environmentally responsible assembly techniques with insights from experts across the electronic assembly industry. Now, here's your host, Mike Conrad. Welcome to another episode of the Reliability Matters podcast, or if you're part of our podcast family, welcome back. For those of you keeping track, this is episode 128. Those of us in the electronic assembly space are no doubt aware of standards. In the simplest terms, standards tell us how to build products correctly. They differentiate correct from incorrect. They tell us what type of materials to use, how a solder joint is determined to be acceptable or unacceptable. Standards tell us how to test various parts of our assembly. How are standards derived? Who determines what the standards are? How often are they updated? To answer these and other questions, I invited Leo Lambert onto the show. Leo is the author of several publications, including Soldering for Electronic Assemblies, published by Marcel. He has published and presented numerous papers relative to the subject of soldering and cleaning at various technical seminars and exhibitions worldwide. Leo developed, published, and conducted seminars entitled Deadline to Lead-Free Seminars and Thriving in a Rojas We Environment. Leo received the prestigious IPC President's Award in 1989 for work conducted on solderable coatings for printed wiring boards. He is an IPC Hall of Fame recipient, charter member of UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, Technical Solvent Options Committee, where he oversaw the worldwide activities in reducing CFCs from use as cleaning materials in electronics manufacturing, resulting in the publication of the Montreal Protocol, an international treaty banning certain CFC-based materials. Leo is a member of ICOLP, Industry Cooperative for Ozone Layer Protection. Leo has been involved in many standards committees and is a recognized expert in standards and He's my guest today on the Reliability Matters podcast. Welcome, Leo. Thanks for being my guest today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. I'm a little humbled by all that, all those fine words. Well, there's a lot of fine words. I edited it down a little bit. Otherwise, it would have been the entire episode with all of your uh, accolades. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you humble. Um, let's put it that way. Uh, Let's start off with uh, something we both have in common, and, and that is uh, our relationship with the Montreal Protocol, um, which, of course, was a ban on, on uh, ozone-depleting substances, uh, and, they, and the primary target was chlorofluorocarbons, CFCs. Um, that was actually what started my business. I, I am very grateful for government intervention in this case. Uh, bring on big government, at least in that context, because... Uh, That's what, um, as you recall, back in the day when the Montreal Protocol was first being discussed, it was a 10-year phase-out of CFCs and from 1989 to 1999. And, um, of course, all the solvents we were using to clean boards, because back then there was no no no-clean flux, pretty much much everything was cleaned. I think if you bought a TV made in Mexico, the old, the old TV sets made in Mexico had what I like to call poor man's conformal coating. You know, it was basically a high rosin solids flux. content rosin flux that they just left on the board. So right. all the dust bunnies and insects and everything, it was like a fly trap. You know, everything would stick to it. But components were so far apart and so large that the conductors were far apart that it didn't create any, you know, real issues. Um, but um, uh, when... The Montreal Protocol was first announced, at least publicly, uh, in 1989. I'm sure you were working behind the scenes long before that. Um, I remember the panic in our industry. I remember magazines um, closer to um, 99 would were publishing the last year, so probably you know early January of 1999. They were saying 11 months to the Montreal Protocol, and then the next issue would be 10 months to the Montreal Protocol. Reminded me of the Iranian hostage crisis when Walter Cronkite every day would say day number or Dan rather, whichever one it was day number, whatever of the, it was the same thing. And, and I think the industry for the greater part of a decade believed that it would fall apart, that there would be loopholes carved in and all of that. And 
DuPont kept making Freon and whoever made Tricolor kept making Tricolor and all the generic equivalents. And I think everyone thought safe, that it was safe, that, you know, it, it'll fall apart. And it didn't. It stuck. And uh, that work that you were involved in, you and many others, I'm sure, that kind of framed out the Montreal Protocol was uh, quite influential. Number one, it was an environmental treaty signed by 11 nations originally in Montreal. But um, I'm sure you're aware of this, but if not, you'll find this as, as a, a bragging point. Um, and that is that the Montreal Protocol is, from what I have read, is only one of two treaties ratified by every UN member country. I think there's about 218 or so UN countries. Um, and they all ratified an environmental treaty. I mean, today, imagine that today, Leo. Imagine today yeah, in our well, polarized society, we could come up with a treaty that says, let's all agree that the <clears throat> sun comes up in the morning and goes down at night. And we could not get every UN member nation to agree to that, right? Uh, someone, they'd be holdouts for whatever reason. Um, but it was quite a significant um, piece of legislation or, or treaty. Uh, and it, it radically changed the electronics industry and, and other industries as well. But, you know, for our purposes, the electronics industry was radically changed. And necessity being the mother of invention, you know, everyone thought a replacement solvent would come out that was even better than Tricor or better than Freon. And that really didn't happen. And the replacement solvents, the alternate solvents, have since, you know, half of those have been banned. And the other half are being banned. You know, they're on a timeline. So um, necessity being the mother of invention, no clean flux came out. Look what you did, Leo. Look what you did. Um, no uh, clean flux of, came one out. One of the things that happened, you know, you start talking about the day that I was watching one of your past broadcasts where you were talking to uh, to Doug Pauls and and uh, and uh, Dave, and it was it was interesting because you were talking about cleaning. We started. It started with me. With was back in nineteen ninety in nineteen seventy six when I was working for digital. And we were cleaning with trichloroethylene. And somebody says, that stuff's no good. That's, we've got to get rid of it. And somebody took some boards home, cleaned them in a dishwasher, brought them back. And we says, do they work? Well, electronics and water doesn't get along. So, But we dried them and plugged them in, and they did work. And they were computer boards, of course, because that was a computer industry at the time. And then... One of the things, my first jobs when I get there was to institute these big aqueous cleaners on the backside of the wave solder machines. And we started doing that. The boards did not quite look as clean because some of the water didn't dissolve the waxes and so on. But one of the things that you were talking about in that presentation was the rose test. Well, to us, that was a solvent extract test, and it was the Kenko machine and the Alpha Ionograph and all those things. And we were getting cleaner boards cleaning with water than we were cleaning with solvents. Yeah. But, of course, we were using rods and fluxes. And as you mentioned in that presentation was the issue about, hey, we got to clean with rods and fluxes because the other materials weren't really soluble in that solvent. So when you ask people, Get any failures? No. Oh, you're cleaning with water, you're soldering with water soluble flux, are you? But that was the whole deal. And we went around the country, we went around the world pushing uh, what we had done, cleaning electronic products with, with water. And the, the, the leader of the pack, I wrote his name now, Steve Anderson. He worked for the EPA at the time. And he was the leader of the pack. And we had people from AT&T and all the big major companies, Ford and so on. And we went to the Far East, we went to Europe, and we're talking to people about the conversion of the solvents that you're using to go to aqueous cleaning and, and stuff like that. And the results of all of that ended up being the Montreal Protocol, which was quite an accomplishment because one of the things that sometimes I get hung up myself when I start thinking about it, but we had physical samples. They had sent balloons up. They had pulled samples of CFCs from the ozone layer and so on. And it was kind of interesting. A few months back or maybe a year or so ago, they started talking about the ozone hole shrinking again. Well, son of a gun, it's working. So that's a to me, that was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, there was some bit of um, controversy, or as our 
friends across the pond would say controversy um, about that. Anytime there's an environmental treaty, there's you know deniers and skeptics, and you know which is healthy. Um, and I remember one of the arguments back in the day was, you know, the the biggest um, uh, factor in ozone depletion is methane gas coming out of cows, and and uh, you know. <laughs> And, and, and there were even groups suggesting that we ban, you know, the, the production of cows and, uh, and, and then volcanoes. You know, one volcanic eruption puts years worth of man-made, uh, you know, uh, gases, uh, ozone-depleting gases. But that doesn't take away from the fact that, you know, we may not be the largest contributor, but we are the only controllable contributor, right? So um, – and the same arguments are being made today with climate change, you know, global warming, you know, exactly. I, I find exactly. it interesting. We went from ozone depletion to global warming. And then when people started saying, well, it's kind of chilly, they said, well, okay, okay. Climate change, you know, <laughs> so, trying to come up with a term that's less divisive, but, um, um, I don't think we can ever, as I said earlier, I don't think we could ever have a Montreal protocol again, you know, that there'd be, you know, too many divisions and, and, and polarizations there. Um, Let's talk about standards. And of course, one of the okay. standards we'll get to, one of the standards was a change in how we uh, consider boards to be clean or clean enough. Um, that radically changed um, and it was, it was in desperate need of change. So, you know, it, IPC did catch up to that and, and Doug Pauls and his Rhino team um, were pretty novel. And, you know, I, I don't think I'm overusing, overstating the term brave to to come up with um, a new standard that didn't give an answer. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't give a pass-fail number, um, but we'll get into that. Let's talk about standards in general from a 30,000-foot view. Um, okay. There's, you know, obviously different trade organizations, IPC, IEEE, others that, that contribute to standards, INEMI uh, perhaps. Um, but how in general are standards created? What's the process in which a standard come uh, is delivered to us. I know it's uh, many people think it's just dropped by storks, you know, onto our onto our desks, but um, clearly there's a lot of a lot of um, detail. Uh, let's look at how the sausage is made and and tell me walk me through the whole standards process. Typically what occurs is that uh, the, 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 and the thing I can I, I start thinking about is something new that comes about. The, the reason the existing documentation, of course, is all evolutionary. So somebody started it, and then they they evolved into uh, the newer methods, the methodologies, materials, and so on. Uh, but we're working with a with, with a group right now where they they're coming up with uh, making uh, three dimensional boards, and the process is we we need to get specifications on on how that's done. And one of the things that happens, or typically the IPC process, is somebody puts in what they call uh, a PIN, which is the product introduction notice, identifying what they want, how they want it, who the team's going to be, and, and, and who's the leader of the team, and how are they going to collect the information. They come up with a chart that's going to tell them, well, th this is our schedule for getting this, this thing done. And it's a matter of collecting the information getting the information together in, a, in some fashion, and, and then I, applying all that information into uh, an IPC format document if we're going to go through the IPC. And then once we get the format, then that document it becomes a draft. And once the draft goes out, then it goes out to the original committee, and the original committee will take a peek at it Make sure that we're, we're, we're talking okay on, on certain things and we're, we're saying it correctly and so on. And then it, the next piece is once the draft gets written, it goes out to people that sign up for the policy, for the policy of the procedure. They all have a, a review at it. Then we start having meetings. Now keep in mind, one of the questions that one of the thoughts that we were talking about was how often do they come out? At one time, the documents were updated every five years. Now they want them updated every three years simply because of the changes in technology that's happening. 
So it requires a lot of meetings to get that done. And if you go and you know, follow some of the IPC, we meet twice a year, once on the far, on the far west and once back somewhere else in the United States. So only meeting twice a year is not enough time to go through all the data. So there's a lot of online meetings that go on where we review the comments that come back from the industry at large. You should be talking more about this, or you should be having this, or you should be adding this, and so on. So once all these things get added and get approved, then the document starts getting published until it gets to a final draft. The final draft goes out to the OO, the entire IPC organization, and they approve the document, and the document gets published. And how long does it take? How long does that whole process take? Is that, in other words, when a document is released? Um, I would have today, a chance to say, are they some starting of the to work on it right now? It's like five years. Yeah. So they, as soon as one's released, that is work beginning on the next revision. Is it is absolutely? It, particularly if absolutely. you're going from five years to three, right? I mean, the yeah. the work begins the moment the the, the ink is dry, or maybe before the ink is dry. The minute, the minute it's released, uh, there are forms that come out because first thing is there's going to be some typos, there's going to be some editorial uh, mistakes and technical mistakes. This is in the wrong place, and you shouldn't have said this. You should say it this way. Uh, that material is no longer available. Uh, take it out of there. And you've got to be careful because of uh, materials that's uh, what's the right word, uh, copyrighted, and, and especially in their names and things like that. So what occurs is that uh, as, as soon as the document is released, they start collecting information on uh, updating the document. So it's, it's, a, it's a continuous process. Now, that continuous process used to go on for five years. Now it goes on for like three years. Get it done. Get it updated. And most of the times now it's new technical components and, and the ones the ones I, I have a tendency to talk more about than anything else is the connectors that go into phones every time a new phone comes out there's a new connector so that's a new component how do you mount it how do you solder it how do you what's its value and so on so there's a lot of things like that that are happening the the, the functionality of the components it's basically it's in a box so that box is the same. It's either a plastic mounted component or a ceramic, or, uh, but they're all the same size and shape. So that, that makes it easy. It's the electronics that's different, not the component. Yeah. But once um, you get the information, you're collecting the information on an ongoing basis, and it starts immediately once the document is released. So it goes out for a review process, and then eventually is it actually voted on by members uh, of of the association or by the committee members only what's the what's the format it's voted on by all the members of the association and you've got a month they'll go out for a month you've got a month to review it and typically it goes to various the, the companies of ipc and typically they look at it and then once the the, the month is up they reconvene the committee and they'll go over every comment and either will approve the comment reject the comment, or if it's a major change, they'll look at it to put it like, let's say uh, it's a class three requirements and the class three people aren't using it yet. And class two people are using it. They'll say, well, why don't we delay this until the next revision? So they'll delay it till the next revision. But typically they work on them. Every comment that's received is worked upon and a decision is made to accept or reject it or not accept it. How often do amendments come out? And I'm, I'm thinking um, of the J standard 001G. Um, in September of 2018, an amendment was made, uh, uh, Amendment 1 of Section 8, uh, which eventually was incorporated and memorialized into the H version of the J standard 001. Uh, our amendments, that was a major change. That was a major change, and it didn't wait until the next release of H. It, it That's was correct. And that's where the team the... with David and, and Doug took over and, and, and started coming up with that, with that process because they had that system that was in the document and the J standard 01 came from the days of 
you know, I, I'm going back a long time now, but I'm going back to the days of 28809 when Dick Motz wrote that document and said, this is how we have to clean the boards. And they were only cleaning the boards because the conformal coating was peeling off the boards. Right. And then the minute they started cleaning the boards and, you know, between you and I, once they put a number on it, everybody says, well, we, we, we've, got, we've got to be better than that. This is not good enough. And then it started expanding and going bananas with how clean was clean. But yeah, yeah, that was that was the deal. But that was a big, that was a major change, and that happened right off the bat. And, and the team took all, took over as part of a subcommittee, and they submitted that to the committee. It got approved, and then we couldn't wait for a new uh, revision to come out, so they released the amendment. Yeah, uh, it it felt like. It was so pressing, it was so urgent, um, in light of the fact that the standard hadn't been updated since really the 70s, and the, and the yep. two people, I forget their names, you, you might remember, but the two people who kind of came up with the number, which we considered pass or fail, uh, the roast test number, which we considered pass or fail, were rather horrified that it was put into the standard for everybody, right? So NASA had the same pass fail limit as the 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 uh hearts dog collar people in you know electronic flea collars it, it was all pass fail and i That's it's right. funny because without you know this is this episode's not cleaning centric but um the pass fail was 10 micrograms of sodium per square inch or 1.56 per centimeter square uh using a rose tester and and i remember many times you know we we make rose testers and i remember you know, years ago telling customer way before the amendment telling customers, like, don't use that as a pass-fail. Don't say 9.9, .9, oof, we almost failed. You know, almost. Ship it quickly before it gets dirtier. Um, you know, to, uh, I said, you know, use it as a guideline. Use it to monitor your process. And, you know, if you're always getting sixes and you never have a failure, and then someday you get a nine, something changed. That's the gold right there. That's the, okay. the relevant information. It, it, it's not so much All the right. number, it's the change in the number. Yeah. And I was delighted. I wasn't part of the committee um, that, uh, that Doug Pauls uh, put together for this amendment. Um, but I was delighted because I felt like they were reading my mind. You know, it's like, we've been preaching that and we build those machines and we've been preaching that don't use them for the reasons you think you're, you're using them for because you're just fooling yourself. Um, but um, during well, the... It was interesting because there was one statement that was made in that presentation about uh, the length of time from the test. The first omega meters was the, the test was 15 minutes, and it was drawing the bromides out of the out of the laminate materials, and, and it was just trailing off. And the guy goes, "Sure, well that material, yeah, but you, you're sucking the material out of the laminate, but yeah, not loud. yeah, you know? yeah." Uh, it, yeah, there was all sorts of issues there. Uh, it, you know, it was kind of a designer test. You know, what number do you want? Yeah, and you could yeah. make it say whatever number you wanted it, for a time. Um, it, uh, yeah, I was very. I think the piece that helped though was to define the failures that you got. You know, what were the failures that were expected? If the board was dirty, what did you have? Something peeled off, and did you have an electric, electrical functionality? What was the failure mechanism? And I don't think they could define that at the time. They would say, well. The conformal coating peeled off. Well, okay, but that doesn't stop the product from working. That probably is going to impact some reliability issue later on, but but yeah. then they started looking at it for failures, electrical failures, and that's when the problems started to come. Right, up. And, and that follows the evolution of circuit assemblies from through-hole to surface mount. You know, the early days of surface mount were basically through hole components with the leads just turned 90 degrees. You know, they, they really weren't, you know, take a dip and just bend the leads 90 degrees outward yep. and that was through hole. Um, so it really didn't, the early days of surface mount really didn't affect the pitch so much. Um, but as boards miniaturized, as components miniaturized, and we started getting conductors, cathodes and anodes, microscopically close together, that changed the focus uh, of cleaning for conformal coating purposes to cleaning to mitigate electrochemical migration and parasitic leakage and all these other electrical issues. Um, right. The problem got serious quite quickly um, and, and the, the old standard didn't help that. Uh, one thing I, I've always found interesting, I, I was involved in a couple of committees. Um, I was involved in the cleaning handbook 
Uh, and um, I, you know, I, I've been in this industry for 37 years, so you tend to know everyone in the industry. And, and I can read through that entire um, handbook, and I can pretty much tell you who wrote or who contributed each section because I can hear their words. I can hear their voices in it. Um, yep. The way they speak, the, you know, everyone has a certain um, um, uh, thing that, that, they, that they bark about loud. I say bark because my dogs are barking. Um, and, um, you know, something that's important to them. And that makes it into the standard quite loudly. And, and I, but that handbook was, you know, very non-commercial, nothing nothing partisan got in there, even though I know who wrote each section, you know, including myself. Um, how often in the process of writing a standard does the committee have to go, no, mm -mm, this is way too commercial. And without naming names or companies, I know that there was an effort in part of the cleaning, general cleaning or cleanliness testing standard to change it, but it would the change would have meant one brand of equipment would have been the only brand they could buy. Um, and it has not been adopted. And I'm assuming that may be one of the reasons because it was too um, singular. Uh, it, does that come up uh, from time to time in standards or does it come, come up, up all often the time. in standards? Yeah. One of, one of the things that happens, especially when you start talking about the J standard over one, if you go back to the days of... Um, uh, Mill Standard 2000, the first Mill Standard 2000, not only told you what they wanted, but told you how to do it. And then when uh, they, we took, when IPC took the, you know, in 85, when all the documents were canceled, uh, they came up with the National Soldering Standard. And then there's a lot of things that happen relative to what tools were we going to use. And, of course, you had a lot of people making soldering equipment. We're going to use ours. And then they says, no, you can't. You can't say it's a company A, company B, company C type of tool because now you're promoting those tools. And IPC didn't want to promote tools. So we had to get generic illustrations of what a soldering iron looks like or what a, a heated vacuum solder sucker look like and things like that. But there was a lot of things to keep... Uh, to keep the to keep them very generic you know you want a soldering iron this is the soldering iron that you should use and instead of using the concept of the like the mill standard 2000 the first one says don't tell us how to do it tell us what you want yes and then once you tell us what you want then we'll try to build it that way and you'll tell us if we're building it correctly or not whether it's the cleaning standards the soldering standards Oh, you know, I want you to use the solder paste from company A and the solder from company B and so on. No, just say, I want you to solder it with this alloy solder. I don't care who you get it from. This is the kind of joint that we want. And they tried to keep it as generic as that. 001 was the tough one. And then, of course, when you went to uh, the 610, which was the visual representation of a lot of things in the 001, you had to be cautious because now you had pictures and some of the pictures were very sensitive to, Oh, that's my picture. And I, I, I can't show that. And so yeah, you can Photoshop so, out I the logo, but people know. Day. Yeah. Yeah. People know they get upset about that. Um, the automotive industry has, you know, they, they live in their own world when it comes to electronics. They have many of the standards on their own. Some are, are, way in excess of, of our standards and some aren't. Yep. And I know there's been some effort from IPC to kind of harmonize um, a standard that automotive, you know, because we've done the work for years. And to some automakers, electronics are, are newer to them, right? With, particularly with the electrification of cars. Um, are, are you aware of, of efforts to get the auto industry to adopt um, current standards or maybe slightly modified standards that, have are, that are already out and proven? Yeah, the ones that they're working on right now is they're working on a J standard 001 because they have an 001. Uh, the people from, uh, from Germany, I want to say it's Udo, is, is, is one of the guys. And, and they're coming up with uh, 
their own 001 standard, not as a there's a talk about merging that 001 standard with this 001 standard. But I think one of the things that people are talking about that we need to understand is you know, the typical electronic products that we're familiar with, like laptops and computers and so on. You plug them into the wall, and when they go into a power supply, and then you're using a 9 volt or a 12 volt system, and then you're running your computers. Whereas the automobiles, you may have a 500 amp system, a 700 volt system, pushing stuff through the boards, and the boards that we're using today may be altogether different than those boards. So we'll have to understand what impact that's going to have. You know, the, you, you may have an automotive sex, a segment and a, and a and an industrial electronic product segment uh, that are that are going to be different, but yeah, they're looking at putting them together uh, because you know how many standards can you have? Right. Yeah. It seems like starting with the basic 001 and then having either either an amended more or a version. You know, um, right now we have you know IPC has the class system, class one, class two, class three. You know, I can almost see. A class A, you know, automotive, because even even people building classic class three, which is you know high reliability, um, you know, a lot of those boards don't have a thousand volts or two thousand volts running through them. Where correct, you know, in the auto industry, that's not uncommon these days to have you know super high voltages running through boards. And um, going back to the subject of cleanliness, just because that's my wheelhouse, you know, you can't even have a dirty thought in your mind when you're running 2000 volts through a board, right? Much less on the board. So um, they have some unique circumstances and pretty much all of their products are subject to harsh environments, shock and vibration, heat. You know, it's, it's, it's the poster child of, of a harsh environment. And unlike automotive electronics in the past, where if the electronics failed, you just you know, your, your seat warmers didn't work or your infotainment system didn't get satellite radio. Now with Correct. the ADAS systems, you know, automatic, you know, lane departure warnings and adaptive, you know, LIDAR, adaptive cruise control and uh, self-driving, you know, it, it's um, unlike the airline industry that has basically three computers to serve every function, you know, one primary, two backups. Um, the auto well, industry doesn't, doesn't have the luxury of having three right. of everything in there. So... Um, and I think the piece that's going to come up with, with this, though, Mike, is is the issue with the autonomous vehicles, the self-driving ones. Somebody makes a mistake, somebody's going to die. Yes. So now you've got to now you've got to sit back and, they, and there's talk because we we've been building products for electronic for the automobiles for a long time. It's all been class two. It's got to work. If it hiccups, you can pull off to the side of the road and right. restart your car. Right. Whereas. Last three, it's got to work the first time, every time, and all the time. And they're talking about class three type products for the electronic, for the cars. And if that's the case, that's going to change a lot of requirements. Plus, the, 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 the mention that you just put together relative to the high voltages and, and the contamination levels. Back in the days when we started talking about specs, I remember when I started going to IPC, they were talking about what's the worst environment, and it was under the hood automobile. Yeah. Regardless of where they were, it was under the hood automobiles the worst environment for, for an electronic product. And you're right. going, well, what's under the hood? You know. Yeah, I, uh, your your point about autonomous cars, you know, people can die. That's that's certainly quite valid. Uh, but even in non-autonomous cars, you know, I have a car that is modern it has all the fancy features it has adaptive cruise control and it can parallel park by itself and and you know blind spot indicators and all that kind of stuff yeah. and when i first got that car i was very skeptical whenever i would change a lane i would of course look in my mirror and then i would look at my blind spot indicator on or off and then i would look over my shoulder right because that's the way we grew up learning to drive um when I was first using the adaptive cruise control and I'm coming up on slowing traffic on a freeway. My foot would go over the brake, just hover over it in case it didn't, yeah. it didn't react. It's never failed me, but the result is I've become a worse driver because I'm now relying on the technology. There was an airline um, that 
landed a, uh, a 777 into San Francisco. The airline was Asiana several years ago. They had three qualified pilots in the cockpit when they were landing because there was a, um, an, uh, a training pilot, um, a, a certified a FAA pilot on the plane monitoring the crew. And they had a very well-seasoned captain and a very well-seasoned first officer plus a fully rated jump seat. And that plane crashed on the runway because they forgot that the auto throttle had turned off. They thought the auto throttle was still on. They basically took a perfectly good aircraft, nothing wrong with it, and they stopped flying the plane because they were relying on automation. And one of the NTSB recommendations was retraining all pilots across all forms of aircraft um, because their thought was they're relying too much on automation and they're much of the time they are not flying the plane. And, you know, right. the last 10,000 feet, the first 10,000 feet, the last 10,000 feet are so critical. There's not even allowed to have, you know, um, extraneous co conversations in the cockpit. They can only talk about things that are going on. You know, they can't talk about their day under 10,000 feet. Um, but the fact that we're relying on automation, even though, um, you know, one might say, well, it's, it, you know, I'm a fully qualified driver or I'm a fully qualified airline pilot, it's still causing safety issues when it either fails or, or, the, or the pilots or the drivers rely too much on the technology and kind of forget to drive, right, or forget to fly. And the thing that happens is once you start going into the automation is the speed, the speed that the automations can react quicker than you running up and jumping your foot on the brake pedal between right. the time you take it off, put it on. It's much quicker now and all those kinds of things come to play, but that's all the electronics. And that's, those are, those are the crazy things that we're all working on. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, it's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah. That, completely. Um, most of my audience is in the electronic assembly space. Um, so what, what trade associations are mostly responsible for the standards that we use? Obviously, IPC is the gorilla in the room, but what, what other um, agencies or associations contribute to standards that we, that we embrace in our industry? The only ones that I can... You know, I, I saw that, that thought that you had. And the only ones I can think of, you've got the SMTA has put, puts out a lot of, of papers and technical papers. And then you've got the, uh, the IEC, the European uh, folks, uh, putting papers together. But for specifications, boy, I'll tell you, unless they're put together by large corporations for their own purposes... And then, you know, share that information. I can't see it. You know, the other big company that used to have a document that you could use was Martin Marietta back in the day. And there was a lot of information in that. And today you've got, of course, the NASA has their own, but they're starting to adopt a lot of the IPC uh, documents. But IPC, I think, is going to be the big uh, the big gun on the, on the block because they're, they're going global and they're paying attention to what's happening all around the world. Mm -hmm. But I can't see any other organizations other unless you have, you have the automotive industry that has, you know, the STM and, 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 and those mm -hmm. people, but they're not covering all the, all the intricacies that are being covered with things like IPC as to the various topics, the various materials like cables and boards and, cleanliness and you know repair processes and so on i don't ipc is is going to be the main the main guy on the block yeah i i agree um how are the standards committees dealing with emerging technologies and i'm thinking ai um 3d printing you know stuff that goes into wearables and and you know, the whole IOT thing. Um, there's so much evolution going on right now. And some might even say revolution, but certainly evolution. Um, and, and it's still kind of a work in process. It's hard to write a standard for something that we don't even understand. So is there, is, are we on the precipice of, of radical new standards? Or do you think that the existing standards can catch up to capture 
the impact of AI, for example? Yeah, AI is going to be interesting. We we have uh, I'm on a new committee that's looking at three D three D printing, and once we go to three D printing, uh, and they have some boards that are functioning, there's no more plated through holes. There's no more solder mass because on the top is the pad. Uh, they're going to plate in the vertical directions. They have some the capability of printing twisted pairs in, the, in those products. So now you start looking at how you're going to do the testing. The testing that we do today, like the, the test method 650 and all those tests, those have to be looked at and how are we going to evaluate these products. The delamination, there's no more delamination, there's no more layers. Okay, uh, the materials that are going to be used, the, the area, the environment that those materials are going to be used. And by the way, uh, one of the comments that came in this past week was AI. How is AI going to affect it? Because some of the people say if AI is going to be used, uh, it has to be documented. And how are you going to document you know, and, and it could be that's going to be an instantaneous type of thing. And I'm, I'm thinking about we need to be able to keep it broad from the perspective of you can't, you know, if, a, if, a, if an equipment is using AI to adjust something, it's going to be it's going to be instantaneous, and you're going to be looking at it instantaneously. So that all has to be developed, and it's not there. Yeah, uh, one of my prior guests on the show was the CEO of a AOI company called Darwin AI. And, you know, they basically make inspection systems, but they really make AI technology that happens to be in an inspection system. Um, and um, one of their attributes, they claim, is that they didn't need super expensive cameras and super high resolution cameras because uh, the AI compensates for that. The, the artificial intelligence can basically interpret more accurately, this is their claim, um, what a component is and, and, you know, its orientation and all the things that AOI is used for uh, with, with cheaper cameras because, you know, the, the, even the cheap cameras are good enough for that if you have, you know, good artificial intelligence or good, good you know, decisions made from those images. Um, and, you know, that's, that's exciting you know, if it's accurate, which I, I believe it is, um, you know, they, they seem like good people um, and I've seen their equipment, but, um, you know, I, I don't know how that would fly in the standards world. You know, I can see someday, you know, I don't know what the AOI standards are, if there are any, but, you know, I can say, you know, s someone says, you know, the new standard is you need a, a 20 megapixel camera minimum. I can see that being part of a standard, whether it is or not, is it's not important. And then what if, the technology evolves through AI in this example that, you know, you can, all you need is a five megapixel camera. Well, you know, is the standard going to be changed, you know, conditionally? I mean, there's a lot of dominoes in effect here. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. But I think if you take a look at it from that perspective, it may speed up things. In the process of inspecting, for example, uh, you know, how close do you, I, I need to have a certain size picture and so many pixels and so on. Now, if I have AI, I may not need all of this kind of stuff and I can inspect the product a lot quicker in the process. Or even if you're going to the previous step, which would be like the pick and place, you know, how do I pick a component up? Where is it? Where am I going to place it? Boom, boom, I've got AI. I look at it. I can place it much quicker. I can place it much faster. And then I can... So I, I think it could increase speeds and things like that. And I don't know how much it's going to cost, but if you start increasing speeds, that's automation, and that may reduce costs and some yeah. other things. But it seems like an impossible task to have the standards keep up with that. You know, um, basically, That's why I said we got to keep it broad, because it, if we it, start getting too sticky with it, you know, you can't get down to the, to the microns on a paper. Exactly. So f several years ago, I was hired as an expert witness in a civil litigation matter between an OEM and a contract manufacturer. And the, 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 the basis for the lawsuit was uh, the statement of work came out from the OEM to the CM. The statement of work was faulty. 
um, and made worse by the OEM directing the CM to skip some steps and to violate known standards. And the CM thought, okay, CYA, we're going to get, you know, we're going to warn the, their customer that this is not recommended. Um, and they got an acknowledgement and said, yeah, we understand, do it anyway, because they were under a lot of uh, financial pressure from their venture capitalists to ship product. And um, uh, long story short, unsurprisingly, products failed miserably. It was a multi-million dollar lawsuit. 50,000 units had to be recalled, and they were not um, in, in a convenient uh, place to get. Uh, and But um, uh, they, they still got sued. And even though they, they had the customer sign off on the acknowledgement that they've been warned, the main claim in the lawsuit was, well, you're supposed to be smarter than us and you shouldn't have done it. You shouldn't have done what we asked you to do. So they deviated from the standards. And IPC allows that. You know, there's always that disclaimer pretty much at the end of any declaration, you know, or as agreed. Agreed between user and supplier. Exactly. How wise is it to do an as agreed, to vary, to, 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 to stray away from the standard. Are there applications where that's wise? Are there more applications where that's rather unwise? What's your, what's your take on that? Thanks. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> that's the answer. I, I, I think my piece would end up being uh, there are some applications in the, in the IPC documents where there's no requirements, for example, for class three. So you get class one, class two, but class three people haven't tried it yet. So now you're going to turn around and if you want to try this particular component, it's going to have to be a bus between you and your supplier or you and you and your manufacturer that you're going to use this piece. Is it, because it hasn't been proven. They haven't done the, the data and all this. And until that data is shown, you've got a hiccup. So if somebody decides we're going to go a bus, it's just it, it cannot just be uh, an agreement that says, "Yeah, you guys know what you're doing. Show me what you've done to show that this is going to work. Let's try it out on a couple samples before we before we decide to to move it into manufacturing. Because you move it into manufacturing, and if it hiccups. And SMT, especially if it's SMT, they're making many, many per minute, and you can have a lot of failures. So the issue is to prove it first. But as agreed between user and supplier, it's not just a handshake. It's got to be, you've got to prove the data, and they've yeah. got to hit the data. And I know when we started, when I started, a lot of the uh, through-hole components were that, that was a, around for a long time. So they just kind of used it as it's it's been used, it's practical, and it works. So when surface mount came out, the issue was the solder joints are smaller, they're gull wings, they're bent, and so on. Did you do the data? What the, What's the data to prove that that solder joint is going to sustain the environment that you're going to subject the product to? So that was the, that was the big piece. That was the big piece. So mm -hmm. to me, if it's a bus, You've got to do the work. You just can't agree to it that says, yeah, you can use it. Don't worry about it. Because every yeah. once in a while, we'll get, stable, we'll get comments that says, well, who told you to do this? Design engineering told us to do this. Design yeah. engineering told you to do it. It's their product. As a, They're responsible for it. As a customer, I would be very skeptical if the assembler asked for a, a deviation in the standards. But my experience with this lawsuit um, is if I was an assembler, I would be even more cautious or skeptical if a customer asked me to veer away from a standard um, because liability goes deep, you know, in for a penny, in for a pound. And even though they, they provided all the disclaimers and warned them, they still got sued. And, and you know, it ended up settling for who knows how much money. Uh, but... I was grateful for it because I made a ton of money off it as an expert witness. But, but um, it, there's there's no amount of indemnification suitable to avoid a costly litigation, right? It's it's just not worth straying away from the standards no, when possible. I mean, you could be as, it could be as simple as that. 
we don't have this component that the guy could turn around and the customer could say, well, use this one. And this one doesn't have the same reliability record as the other ones do. Exactly. So, you know, yeah. now, you, now you're stuck. Uh, in your opinion, but is yeah, the, it is expensive. In your opinion, is the current procedure for writing standards um, adequate? Or do you think the actual procedure needs to be updated? Are we keeping up? Oh, I think, no, I don't think we're keeping up. And I, the reason I don't think we're keeping up is simply because uh, the, the philosophy of IPC documents right now is let me tell you what I'm going to tell you, let me tell you, and let me tell you what I told you. <laughs> okay? So I'm gonna, we're going to talk about this. This is what we're going to talk about. And then when you're all done, you say, you repeat it again. But I believe... The, the demographics of, this, of the people coming into the business, the younger people, learn differently than we did. And I think we need to be able to take a look at that. And how did they learn? You, you go into a classroom today, they do a lot of work with the local high schools and stuff like this. And you go to class, the kids have earphones on and they're listening to music and they're in class. We used to sit down in a row and every, it was just a row kind of thing. Now they're playing with teams. They're doing different kinds of stuff. We need to take a look at the way we present the material in training classes or in specifications that are broken down into very modules that, that, that are specific, to a, specific uh, to a specific item. I think that, that ends up being the big piece. If we could end up doing that, I think that would help the documents a lot. It would change the format of the documents but I think we need to change the mentality. You know, it's like watching television. You get a 30 second ad and they're moving all kinds of stuff. We've got them in a room for eight hours. Visualize that. They don't like that. Yeah. And I, I think that's, that's going to be a big deal. And we need to be able to look at that as, as part of a specification writing organization that, that how, how are we going to handle that? Yeah, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that's just kind of the new world that we live in right now. That's yeah, the reality. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the good news yeah. though, is that in, in a few years, these young people with their earbuds and, and distractions will be writing those standards. So, you know, that maybe they'll write it in a way that the next generation is able, blood. able to read. Yeah. We'll be, we'll be sipping martinis under a palm tree on the sand by the time that happens, hopefully. Uh, if someone wants to become involved in a standards committee, what's the process? The easiest way to get it is to get on the IPC webpage. And if, if you've got a comment that you want to make, uh, the, the new form is uh, IPC Works, ipcworks.org. And once you get on there, you can just follow the, the procedures that are identified. If, if you've got something to submit, you can submit it. If you've got an idea, you can submit an idea. And if you want to join a committee, you can join a committee. And uh, you don't have to be a member of IPC to join an IPC committee. Interesting. So, and there's no lipness test. There's no qualifications, right? It's just anyone no. can sit on the committee. I, I would recommend that, particularly for emerging engineers, younger people in our industry. Not necessarily because they have a lot to offer. Necessarily, they may. But I think it's a great learning experience to see how the sausage is made. And, and it will be a free source of education as well because you'll learn more, way more than you ever intended to about one particular subject or, or an array of subjects in, in one particular arena um, than you would uh, by just reading the standard the moment it's published, right? You'll yep. understand the, the method behind the madness uh, a yeah. little bit more. There's, there's a thing going on right now that they've started, uh, I would say, a couple couple meetings ago, so that's probably a couple years back, Emerging Engineers. And what do the students coming out of school, the colleges, what do they know and what do they need to know to get into the boards, the electronic business? And once we started subbing things out, there was a lot less involvement, but now it's the, there's stuff coming back. And, and they're saying, well, what do we need to know? You need to know these kinds of things. So they're taking these young engineers, but 
the commitment is the piece that's going to be tough. They're going to need a commitment from their companies to be able to go to these meetings and to participate. And part of the exercises that they have them do is go around talking to different people, finding out different things, asking different questions, and then coming back. And uh, I know that uh, Dave Hillman and, and Doug Pauls and those guys have done a tremendous amount of work with emerging engineers, having them work with them. And, th- and that's a big that's a big to do because that's how we're going to get the next generation out there. And I can't believe we're almost out of time. Um, time goes real fast when we yeah. talk this stuff. Um, what would you uh, say are the most significant changes and standards coming our way? What's uh, Get out your crystal ball. Get out your your knowledge of what's coming. Are there any, you know, major things coming our way that will be, for example, the, the cleanliness testing process monitoring requirements were a major change, a total departure of what IPC has done in the past. Are there any other significant changes coming our way that's going to rock our world for better or for worse? I think that the, the new products coming out, I, I think the, the, the three dimensional printing is going to be a big deal. I think the wearables are going to be a big deal. Uh, uh, you know, shirts and the ability to measure your body functions through your through the materials in your shirts and stuff like that. Uh, the miniaturizations of of, of, uh, of the components and stuff and from a medical perspective. Uh, there are some components now, and the cameras. We had someone in our office uh, a while back. And they were showing a camera, and the camera was less than, I, I want to say, uh, it could be more than, than, than a 30-second 30 by 30-second. And there was a camera that would be in, injected into you, and they could look around. So you could take a camera like that, you could put it in the pill, you know, just for the sake, not to be gross, but you could put it in the pill, you could take the pill, and they could do an endoscopy and a colonoscopy all in one shot. Yeah. And you could... You, There'd be no intrusion type of thing. So I think I would rather have a is, colonoscopy that way than the other way, for sure. That seems right. I, I would <laughs> much right. rather yeah, go through right. here than than the alternative. <laughs> yeah, for, absolutely. Sign me you up for that. Pill, but when you talk to, when you talk to the people, now they're talking about if somebody does that and they can control it remote control, they can stop it anywhere down the track monitor around, look around, and then they can, they can have the whole the whole thing done. So I think the medical business is going to be big. That automobile, you know, the the, the autonomous cars, uh, three-dimensional, and the materials. And the materials are going to be big because, you know, you got watches now. I see people on watches. And when, when I was a kid, it was Dick Tracy. You know, he talked at the watch. Yeah. Now people are talking into their watches. It's yeah. Like, what? It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, yeah, art became life. Um, you talk about the pills that can be driven around like a drone, driven around the inside of your body. That reminds me of the old Disney ride um, way back in the uh, 70s uh, called Journey Through Space. It's where Space Mountain is today. Oh, no, it's where yeah. uh, Star Tours is, is today. Uh, it was it was um, sponsored by Monsanto. And you got in these little cars and then you, uh, you know, the, the theory was you originally, you, you allegedly shrunk to the point where you are now inside the human body and you're going through veins and arteries and, you know, everything's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And um, it, that kind of a, you know, that's, again, art, you know, eventually imitating life, right? Pre, yeah. a, a precursor to, to real world. Um, but I think if you think the other thing that you mentioned was the, the AI stuff. I think just think of the AI stuff in the medical business. Well, yeah. Let's just start thinking about all the all the stuff that people have and the diseases that they have. If that helps that, that's going to be another major, major thing. Absolutely. Um, so. I can I see a future where instead of going to the urgent care, you, you just get on their website and an AI doctor you know, uh, determines what's wrong with you and, and, and prescribes a prescription and all this Side stuff. your camera on your heart, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So hold on. Yeah. Let me drive this around. Yeah. Um, yeah. Last question. Where do you see the future of standards in our industry? Just the future, not, not any specific standard, but just, uh, you alluded to it a little bit about, you know, maybe making some changes to how we, we write standards, but um, wh- where do you think we are in general? 30,000 foot view. 
a 30,000 foot view, there's a lot of documents out there. I, I think the piece that we need to keep up is a lot of the handbooks that are created. We can't take anything out of it because I get a lot of questions that come to me all the time. It's where does this come from? And people are looking for the historical information as to why, why is that statement in there? When, when, when did that change? And I think those handbooks are going to be the books that are going to be like, you know, the, I can't think of the word off the top of my head, but they're going to be the book that you're going to be looking to, like the dictionary type. It's of the thing. Bible, the, the 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 reference material. For... Yeah, the reference documents, and yeah. you're going to need to, you're going to need to have all of those. And I think the ability to have the documents online and the ability to use the documents online. So if somebody's building a product, they can the the, the electronics can take the product and can take the spec and can, can match it up and say that doesn't exist. That's the wrong statement. And you can do you do those kinds of things like use an artificial intelligence for to correlate the process to the documentation. I right. think that's that'd be the big thing to, to happen. In the, in and if you think how AI works, it's 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 a little bit of a misnomer, artificial intelligence, because the intelligence came from humans. You know, it it just it just has the ability to scour through trillions of pages of data and it's smart the the intelligence part is being able to contextualize all that data and and uh, serve up a a relevant contextual response but the even the work we do in standards makes its way into ai models right because that's some of the material it has read and um serves back up again so you know, the, the standard. But it has no empathy, right? So it doesn't know, it doesn't have any feelings. Nope. So. It has no commercial, um, at least at this point, it has no commercial motivation. I can see that right. being manipulated uh, by humans, but at this point, it's it's a nonpartisan, um, just yeah. raw information. Yeah, it's just like yeah. not good or bad. It's just, it's just that's the fact. Well, Leo Lambert, um, I really appreciate your time. It's been about an hour, we're, we're out of time. Uh, I appreciate all the work you do in the standards. It's always good to see you. And uh, thanks for thank sharing you. your you wisdom and your experience with my audience. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Well, that's another episode. Thank you for listening to or watching the Reliability Matters podcast. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. Or if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, be sure to click the like, subscribe, and bell icons to be notified when new episodes are released. We release new episodes on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Once again, a special thanks to Circuit Assembly Magazine's PCB Chat at pcbchat.com and Ascendo Reliability at reliability.fm for syndicating this show. Thanks again for being part of our podcast family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, and perhaps most importantly, keep doing it right. And I'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for listening to the Reliability Matters podcast. Join us on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month for new episodes of Reliability Matters.